welcome back everyone. Hope you enjoyed your break, had time to stretch, get a coffee, maybe a water, who knows, reflect on the last few sessions that we had. I'm really excited about this next session. We'll be talking about the patient and caregiver journey through the lens of five individuals that I am so grateful to call my friends and colleagues. Such a unique experience going through the heart failure journey. And you're gonna hear this from diagnosis through Cynthia Culhane to living with heart failure and finding hope in heart failure with Tracy Bottenheimer to living with heart failure at Wayne Sandvik through transplant with Donna Hart and then a unique experience and perspective from caregiver Heather Lannan. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Cynthia. Cynthia, here you go. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for having me. Obviously, this is a pretty exciting experience for us patients to get an opportunity to share our experience. And I really love this journey that we're going to be on today where we, we take different perspectives from different people as the journey proce proceeds through. Um, so to give you a little bit about my background, I have, um, I have four children. I am a mother of four, I have three older daughters, and then my youngest is a little boy. He's gonna be turning eight next month. And I'm, well, during pre-pandemic, I also teach a class at Good Life, which is a fitness class. It's something that I've been really excited about and something that I've always been fairly active, which plays into my story a little bit. And then I'm also a realtor. And so if you are a workaholic like myself, that's the perfect job. Perfect job is to be a realtor because you can work pretty much 24 seven. So from a lifestyle perspective, as you can imagine, super busy lifestyle and nothing ever really slowed me down. And so when the, the experience starts with me going to my massage therapist. So as I I assume all of you guys can certainly understand is when you're sitting at your desk for long periods of time and everybody's shoulders are up, you get tension headaches. And so I would spend hours and hours sitting at my desk and need to get some, some sort of relief from these tension headaches. So I would go to my massage therapist who happens to be my brother-in-law. And this particular day I was laying down on my stomach and he was as part of the massage process. He's like massaging everywhere. And he was massaging my calf. And when I laid on my stomach, I could feel my pulse through my whole body. And to me, that wasn't odd. And so when he was massaging my calf, he said, wow, I can feel your pulse through your whole body. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, that's weird. And literally we never spoke another word about it. I, I just took that in and thought, okay, well, I'm not really sure why it's weird, but that's my body. And that's always been like that. And so Fast forward a couple months later, I go for an annual physical with my doctor, just regular routine annual physical. And she was going through all of my, all of my blood work and, you know, all this stuff that typical annual physical stuff and, you know, proceeds to tell me how healthy I am. And, and she said, do you have any questions for me? And for whatever reason, the thing that's so odd is I never really thought about the conversation that I'd had with my RNT before that, that moment. And I said, well, actually my massage therapist told me that he could feel my pulse through my whole body. I thought it was kind of odd. And so she said, well, you're in your forties. So why don't we have a, an extra little scope on, into your heart and let's have a look at it. So she didn't, you know, listen to it and didn't hear anything else. And so she sent me for an ECG the ECG came back with this little, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't even really know what it means. It's LBBB, which is left bundled branch block. And the beautiful thing is most of the people on this call will understand most of this language, but it, it very quickly became irrelevant. So she said, I went back to the doctor and she told me that this had come up with the ECG and said that, well, we should do an echocardiogram. She just had a feeling that it's, it's something to look into. It can be an indication of heart disease, is what she said to me. And she said, I can't imagine your lifestyle that you have heart disease, but I want to rule it out. And so I went for, I actually didn't go to the first one. We had it booked and I canceled it because I thought I'm healthy. I'm good. I don't need to go for this. So 
then she followed up with me and said, did you get that echo done? And I said, no, I didn't. She said, please just, let's just do it, rule it out. And so I did end up going to the next one. And so the echocardiogram, I, I won't get into all the details of it, but the cardiologist that was doing the reading that particular day came in after all the pictures were done and said, he said he had a few questions for me and he started asking me questions like, so when you're teaching your class, how often do you faint or how often do you have to, how long do you go before you have to quit? And I was, I was like bewildered. I was like, I just finished when the class is over and he asked me if I was fainting and holding flu to my legs. And I, I literally was so confused. I said, just so you know, like my name's Cynthia, like, I think you maybe have the wrong person. And he said, no, no, I actually am talking to the right person. And he said, I'm not going to get into it with you today. I'm going to get you to go back to your doctor, but you need to get to a cardiologist and, and pretty quickly. And I said, well, that's kind of freaking me out. And he said, well, don't freak out, which is really cool. Like, I love that after you've been told you have some sort of condition with your heart that you shouldn't freak out. But um, needless to say, he did say you need to get on to or into a cardiologist within a few days and you get put onto this rapid access list and then you get seen with a cardiologist what, within 10 days. And so this man ended up becoming my cardiologist. And so the, the diagnosis with him, he came back and he said, so you've got what we call dilated cardiomyopathy, which is really big words for, I have a really weak pump. So we went, the next course of action was to get MRIs done. We got two MRIs done. I had a an angiogram done. Angiogram came, angiogram came back with my, everything was clean as a whistle, as they say. So, which I kind of, in a, in a funny way, I kind of expected or hoped that maybe that's what it was. So I could have an answer because mine's idiopathic, meaning that we don't really know why we have it. And so we did the second MRI because the first one came back with my ejection fraction as 34% the first time, but then he said he didn't believe that that was actually the number. So we did the second one and it came back at 18%. And so an, a healthy heart is between 50 and 55%. So as you can tell, not a great diagnosis. And so we decided the course of action was to get an ICD implanted. So I've got the CRTD, which is a um, cardiac implanted. Uh, one moment. A ICD implanted cardiac device, and it's it's got the um, resynchronization therapy as well. So it's got two leads on it. So long story short, it's it's to make sure that if my heart got into a situation that I've got basically EMS on board, and unfortunately it it has gone off once. But at the end of the day, the, the diagnosis, I'll just summar, summarize it. The diagnosis for me was shocking because I've always lived a healthy life. If you look at the reasons for causes a lot of the time for dilated cardiomyopathy, I, I have none of them. And being idiopathic, it's just something that I have to live with. And you know, the first, the first risk is sudden death. And at the time when I got diagnosed, my little boy was only one year old. And so as you can imagine, this was pretty frightening. And so getting the ICD put in as quickly as I could was, was the focus for me. And a couple, two last thoughts. One, when the, after the implantation was completed, they, they kind of give you a little pamphlet and they kind of pat you on the bum and they say, okay, well, good luck to you. And off you go. And you venture out into this new world with this diagnosis and this new lump of metal in your chest and not really know what to expect and it was a pretty frightening experience and to be honest with you the way I'll leave you with this thought is after all the chaos and all the tests were done and everything settled I had the implantation done and life went back to normal but it went back to normal for everybody except me and so this is the the beginning of my journey and we're I'm excited to pass it over to Tracy to take you through living with heart failure and finding hope. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, yeah, a lot of overlaps between our stories. Um, and, and 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'll say hello and thank you for being with us today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to walk through how I, I lost hope and I found it again. Um, so my story begins in 2013. Uh, that summer, I was hiking a 6,200 foot peak in the eastern US and by December, I was really struggling to make it up the local hill in my neighborhood. I went through all through that fall, I had been dizzy, I'd been getting more and more short of breath, um, my heart was racing, I was gaining weight and all these symptoms were happening more frequently and um, with longer durations and any time, night or day. So it, it might seem really obvious now, but at the time, I didn't have any experience with serious illness. And so I just assumed that because I'd always had good health, that I was in control of it, that I was somehow responsible to fix it. Um, I had two busy teenage boys. I had a really demanding career. I traveled 50% of my time for work. Um, and so and my diet and exercise had been taking a bit of a hit. And so it was really easy to think that I was just getting out of shape. I was stressed. Um, but finally, one night, I, after about eight hours of feeling nauseous, dizzy, bloated, and my heart racing, I woke my husband up to tell him that I, I did need help. Um, so we arrived at emergency and the nurse couldn't get an accurate blood pressure reading. My heart rate was really erratic. Um, so I was whisked in pretty quickly. And um, the ED doctor gave me two shots of adenosine to stop and start my heart and then um, cardioverted me twice before admitting me to CCU. Um, so I, I now know that I was in full heart block and NYHA stage four heart failure. I've also learned that I was having life-threatening arrhythmias with less than a 1% chance of surviving. So I was really fortunate to have arrived in emergency when I did. Um, the first day in the hospital, I was told that I wouldn't be leaving without a diagnosis, a treatment plan and an ICD or I'd be dead sooner than later. So some things just kind of stick with you. That's the only quote I can remember from the whole time. Um, so the, ne the next few days had a couple more cardioversions, lots of tests, and I was discharged 10 days later on Christmas day with um, a CRTV, a diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis and more medications than I'd ever seen in my life. Um, my, my cardiologist really tried to warn me that this would be a long recovery process, but in my mind, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. So I could picture the six weeks of surgical recovery. And then I thought I'd be back to work, back to life as I knew it, back to normal. Um, because I really thought that I'd been fixed. So I wasn't worried at all. I was scheduled to do a one month um, treadmill stress test at my checkup. And I knew the appointment was 30 minutes long. And the technician told me that he would increase the levels as time went on. So being a little bit competitive. In my mind, that translated to stay on the treadmill for 30 minutes and get to level 10. Okay, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> um, so as I walked to the cot feeling pretty disappointed and very ill, uh, the technician saw my heart go into VTAC on his monitor. And um, as he turned to check on me, saw my ICD deliver its first life-saving shock. So sarcoidosis is an inflammatory autoimmune condition. So in addition to amiodarone and several heart medications, I was put on the steroid prednisone, a high dose of that. So not only did I have potent medications with multiple side effects, my life as I knew it had been suddenly turned upside down and I had PTSD now from my ICD shock. So I just felt like my life was in limbo. Um, we were adjusting medications, doing more tests, adding more specialists, and I just kept thinking my old life must be right around the corner. Uh, and in 2016, I, I did think maybe I can go back to work now. Um, I wasn't really my old self, but maybe I was good enough. So I started to really push to be normal, to do normal things, um, to be ready. And as a result, over the course of a month, I went from 
feeling not bad to not being able to get up the stairs from our basement. So that was the fall of 2016. And my heart failure symptoms were worse than ever. I was told that my leaky tricuspid valve was severe, that the right side of my heart seemed to be collapsing. And if we couldn't get the sarcoid under control and my heart continued to deteriorate, then either some valve work or, and or potentially even a transplant were likely in my future. And that's, that was the first time when I really realized that I had heart failure. Um, so I was put back on steroids and for the first three months I, I did improve um, and then I plateaued and then I began to deteriorate. Um, at knowing that in 2013 I had waited several months and put myself in real danger and in 2016 I'd waited a month to get help and done more damage, I really felt a bit like Goldilocks, like I, I need to get this right this time. And so as soon as my gut said so, I started to raise the red flag, but unfortunately it wasn't clinically evident. So I heard, but you look really good. Um, your numbers are good. Maybe you've plateaued and finally try to get some sleep. And so I really began to think this is it. This is my new quality of life and it's not good enough for me. Um, and that's when I lost hope and I fell into a, a very deep, very dark hole. Fortunately, that summer, the ICD clinic picked up VTAC in my checkup. And so I knew I was right, something was wrong. And with that little validation, hope returned. It was real and tangible and there were options. Um, not long after, crouching to move a plant triggered VTAC that quickly led to a heart rate over 200, and I'm told I was heading for V-fib when I lost consciousness and my device triggered. But I held on to my hope because my team could deal with this. New medications were discussed and others were increased. And that's the thing, throughout my journey, I've been incredibly fortunate to be a patient of a heart function clinic. So in addition to my cardiologist, this has given me access to cardiac rehab, um, nurse practitioners and mental health supports. And that support has informed and enabled me to manage my own health. Um, and the hard work of cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness training, um, counseling, and yes, even antidepressants has helped me accept that my old normal is not coming back and it's okay. It took me a really long time to fully understand what chronic meant and that bad things can happen to good people. So hope has really become the foundation of my well-being. I suspect I'll still have ups and downs, but hope helps me find peace. I've had to learn to approach life a little differently. I know what can happen to me if I don't listen to my body. So I remind myself, it's not that I can't do things, it's that I need to do them a little differently. I've learned to say, I get to. I get to be out there exploring, hiking, biking, um, the goal is no longer the highest peak or the fastest time. The goal is simply the experience. Planning and forethought are key, and there's definitely a difference between rest days and bad days. Um, so I've learned to do what I can, when I can, and be patient in between. So I'll just wrap up with one last thought. Um, everyone's expectations for quality of life are different. And it's really, really important to understand what's important to you and what brings you joy and find ways to incorporate those things into your life. I really believe that holding on to hope is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself. So with that, um, thank you for listening. And uh, it's my pleasure to pass you over to Wayne who will share his experience of living with heart failure. I'm trying to get my picture up. There we go. Hang on, back up. Okay. Teresa, that's an amazing story. Unbelievable. Good afternoon to the HeartLife Foundation, all the distinguished presenters, and most importantly, hello, and good afternoon to everyone else that is registered for today's Zoom meeting. It's an honor to be here. 
My name is Wayne Sandvik from Sault Ste. Marie, and I've been asked to speak about living with heart failure. Do you really want to know what it's like living with heart failure? It's like you're carrying some added weight on your shoulders. At first, that weight brings you right down, and you end up being miserable to those around you. And you don't even notice. You just know that you're having a bad day, or two, or three. But eventually, your body starts growing stronger, and the weight less noticeable. In fact, you tell your spouse or loved ones that you feel pretty good or that you're in a good mood. Before you know it, you've had a bunch of good days in a row. That added weight in your shoulders, you hardly notice it. It's there, but you can deal with it. So how did I end up with heart failure? Well, six days after I turned 60, I had a major heart attack in my circumflex artery. Having a heart attack in a city that doesn't have a stent lab usually means flying by air ambulance to the closest hospital that can provide service, which for the Sioux usually means Sudbury or Toronto. Problem was, it was a foggy day in the Sioux. Now, the Sioux is known for steel and hockey. In the middle of January, it's usually minus 10 or 20. Probably the main reason we play hockey, because we have lots of snow and lots of ice. Fog is just never a factor. But because we did have fog, there wouldn't be any air ambulance. Instead, I was treated with a 300 kilometer ambulance ride to Sudbury. I found out later that I was in a pretty bad shape and the doctors didn't think I would make it. It took well over eight hours from when, I, from when my heart attack occurred until my treatment began. And that delay caused major damage. And that's why I now have heart failure. While in Sudbury, the doctors inserted two stents, but they also made a decision that my heart needed to rest for a few days. So they put me in a medically induced coma and included a balloon pump. Here's a picture of me with numerous bags of fluid. Mark, can you put that up? There we go. Numerous bags of fluid, IV tubes, monitors, and even a ventilator. Now, if you look out the window, you'll notice no fog. Once I was released, life changed immediately. There was a whole bunch of meds to pick up and then organize as to when to take them. At first, my body and heart just wanted to rest. I slept a lot at first. And for the first few months, my face had a bit of a gray look to it. We had to change the food I was eating, more of a European diet, and of course, no salt. I wasn't eating a lot at first, but slowly my strength came back. In the first few weeks after I got home, I had appointments with my family doctor, with a cardiologist, respiratory therapist, immunologist, dietitian, blood tests, and even a nurse that would come to our home to answer any questions we might have, to discuss diet, salt, and to check my BP impulse, and to explain the cardiac rehab program. Once I finally began the rehab, it really helped me because it gave me something to look forward to and clearly helped with my strength and recovery. And believe it or not, I actually saw a few people I already knew. This picture here is myself with Dr. Rishi Ghosh, two months after my heart attack. This gentleman saved my life. After about three months, I made it back to the office. And I have to tell you how emotional it was for me as colleagues came by to shake my hand or give me a hug. That definitely helped in my recovery. I continued rehabbing on my own and got back to work after six months. Living with heart failure is something that doesn't go away. You think about it every day, whether it's when you take your meds or at other times, such as when you go for a walk. At first, you can be a little short of breath, which can be rather disturbing, but you soon, to, soon learn to adjust your pace. Doctors will ask, are you out of breath? And I want to scream, yeah, but it's not my heart. It's the damn drugs you're giving me. Or I'll tell them I'm not sleeping through the night. And I know it's not my heart. The problem is I end up taking a nap two or three times a day because the drugs take all, call, all cause sleepiness and drowsiness. And that really screws up my nighttime sleep. Finally, my family doctor suggested I try some melatonin and that helped quite a bit. Here's a crazy picture here. For the past few years, I've been keeping my pill bottles. I don't know how, I don't know why I keep them. Maybe just a reminder to, to me of what I've been through. It's about 109 pill bottles there and a bunch of vitamins in the back. If you're a heart patient, there's a constant balancing act as you watch what you're eating and drinking each day, and then keeping an eye on your weight, your blood pressure, 
your pulse, and even your oxygen intake. I highly recommend using tools such as a Fitbit, Apple Watch, or some of the cell phones out there that can help monitor your pulse. You can get a blood pressure monitor for your home. And there's even a little machine that hooks up to your cell phone that can record and share your ECG. These tools and others give us instant feedback. It's not that we want to be our own doctor. And we're certainly not qualified to read an ECG. But knowing our pulse and blood pressure are important because we know what's our normal. You see, it's because when we have a funny little feeling in our chest, or even feeling a little dizzy, it's good to know if all our systems look good or if it's time to head to emerge. Heart failure is a chronic progressive condition. It doesn't go away. And that's why heart failure is not just a physical condition, it's also mental. Because as patients learn more, they start to worry, which can lead to stress, anxiety, and depression. Not to mention the suffering they bring their loved ones. In fact, I'm living proof. I've had pericarditis, pneumonia, two separate iron infusions, bronchitis, AFib, and hyperthyroidism, some of which brought stays in the hospital. You think I haven't worried? I've been exhausted from the drugs I take. I've been up with a cough till five in the morning. That definitely causes worry and anxiety. But like I said earlier, there's good days and bad days. Here's a good day. Next picture, Mark. My partner and I with the mayor and the chamber of commerce as we open a new office. Another good, next picture, another good day with my wife at a Greek restaurant in Toronto. And for all the medical professionals out there, can you see that little glass of wine there? I'm not really sure who put that there. I think it was some guy in a white shirt. I mentioned that heart failure is also a mental condition. How could it not be after going through a life-changing experience? Mental health information and strategies should be as common as the meds we take, the Mediterranean diet that, we, that is prescribed, and the exercise that we need. We now live in a world where anxiety, stress, and depression are recognized. We've all heard of Bell Canada's annual Let's Talk Day. I mean, even Tony Soprano went to a therapist. There's 600,000 heart patients in Canada and it's growing every year. I'm certain that if we recognize mental health and pre prescribe strategies or, th or therapy, you'll see many of us having more good days than bad and enjoying even longer time with our loved ones. This last picture is of my loved ones. They're the reason I keep eating fish and salads and going for a walk when all I really want is pizza and a couple beer and sitting down to watch the Leafs play. So that's my story summed up in about eight or nine minutes. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and for your time. Donna, it's your turn. Thank you, Wayne. And thank you, HeartLife, for inviting me to speak. On August 2014, my husband and I cycled from the Bow River to Lake Louise. September, I rode the 80 kilometer epic tour, thinking that I would not take any breaks from riding next year because I was feeling a little tired through the ride. December, two December 12th, I swam 2.2 kilometers, but I just couldn't seem to catch my breath. December 14th, I could not dress myself without being out of breath. I went to my local hospital and was taken from there by ambulance to the regional cardiac center and admitted into cardiac ICU. My journey into heart disease was just getting started. After 18 days in the hospital, I was discharged with a diagnosis of heart failure. Two weeks later, I was back in intensive care and things were about to go from bad to worse. January, 2015, I was moved from the regional cardiac center to Peter Mudd Cardiac Center ICU. My heart function was 13% and the realization that without a serious intervention, I would have two weeks to live was immeasurably sad. The next day, the doctor came in and talked to me about my heart. She stated that my left ventricle was too damaged for an LVAD and that I would need a heart transplant to live. My son and husband were with me and my son looked like she'd hit him with a brick. We were all in shock. It was a lot to take in. The testing to see if I would be a good candidate to to be a good candidate began. I had a pulmonary lung function test. That was exhausting. The family
interview was two hours long and it took everything I had to sit up for it. I was so exhausted. Extensive workup was done and interventions including a heart biopsy, which confirmed a diagnosis of giant cell myocarditis in addition to congestive heart failure and ventricular tachycardia. When I was being listed, I wanted to hit the sweet spot. I couldn't imagine getting any sicker and I also wanted the team to see me as a great candidate. I was all positive and was soon to realize that meant we were universal donors, but very picky receivers. In February, 2015, I received an ICD and a few days later, I was sent home where I thought I would wait for the call. I was told I would not be going back to work and I should apply for CC disability, which I did. One of my friends told me that she thought I would go home and spend the summer gardening, going for walks and lying about the pool. That was not to be. My energy level was poor and I could walk about 250 meters before any would need to head home and rest. Resting figured largely into my daily plans. I would rest before every task and my friends would come to visit me at my home. And most of the time I could not sit up for the entire visit, wondering what they must think of me that I can't even sit up when they come to visit me. Conversely, they were equally surprised that I had become so ill. March 2015, I was called back to the hospital and admitted to the cardiac ICU and told I would not be leaving until a new heart came in. This is when the stress of my heart disease and the weight hit my family the hardest. For myself, hanging over my head and my now failing kidneys was a mechanical heart. I could not bear the thought of two operations and waiting in the ICU attached to a mechanical heart. The doctors were thrilled that they had this device to keep me alive. And I kept asking for one more day. On more than one occasion, I dodged the mechanical heart by willing my kidneys to get better. My dear friends from Barbados were coming to see me and I didn't want them to see me hooked up to mechanical heart and that bought a weekend. Unbeknownst to me, the doctors had told my husband that my prognosis was not good. My husband let my friends know and had a lot of friends come to visit me one weekend. A good friend later told me she did not think that she would ever see me alive again. Some days I found the stress unmeasurable. I would just want it to be over, put in the mechanical heart, get it over with. I would lie in bed and tell my heart disease that soon you will be gone and I will still be here. And I wondered what it must be like to be on death row. At least they had a date. My one coveted privilege was that I could walk in the atrium by myself and I went every day and walked round and round. On May 6, my husband had a heart attack while riding his bike. He was in cardiac intensive care at the regional hospital. The air was sucked out of the room. This is when I asked my friends and family for help. Hello, as most of you know, it's been quite a week for the heart cirrhotic root. Certainly a covert, a covert secret cell tried to take one out of our key players. Thank you for your love and support that has gotten through, through a very difficult week. Everyone is asking what they can do to help. And I always say nothing, we are fine. But now I have something to ask of you. Thoughts become actions. From now till May 11th, every time you think of me, I only want you to think, this is Sunday, Mother's Day, Donna will have a new heart. Thoughts become actions. This Sunday, Mother's Day, I will have a new heart. Thank you for your support and have a lovely weekend. On May 11th, 2015 at 7.30 a.m., Dr. Mo came into my room and asked me if he knew why I was there. He had a big smile on his face and I thought, I'm his first patient that day and he has a new bag. He told me my heart was in. A large range of emotions on that day from excitement to sadness. After all, a family had just lost a loved one. Recovering from a heart transplant bar none is the hardest thing I've ever done. Everything is an effort. You're taking all these drugs and your body needs to get used to that and recovering from a huge surgery, your body is bruised and battered. You have multiple medical appointments. It's a blessing, a gift, and a lot. Emotionally, it was hard for me to hear people talk about getting the call when I had waited inpatient. It was difficult to hear about people going to the doctor because they had a racing heart, realizing that I never felt my heart racing when I'd had a week of tachycardia and the realization of just how damaged my heart was. It was difficult to know that post-transplant, I had a pacemaker because I have complete heart block, the highlight reel. 
By June, I was riding my bike outdoors. I could walk, but not very far and not very well. I practiced in the pool and around the shallow end. September, I went back to swimming with my club. Jump ahead to August 2016, I competed in five events at the Canadian Transplant Games and medaled in every event I entered. My friends had a notion that I should go for records. So in July 2018, I competed in five events at the Canadian Transplant Games and won every event I entered. I'm happy with my times and because I've competed in two different age groups, I have six records, sw swimming records at a Transplant Games. My last competitive stop was at the World Transplant Games in 2019. I entered one cycling and three swimming events, taking home a bronze and a silver in the pool. I worked really hard to get my old life back and it took a long time for me to wrap my head around that it was not gonna happen. Heart disease was not the life I envisioned for myself, but there was a change in the flight pan and I landed in a different place. I learned a new language and I met a whole group of people that I would have never met. I have welcomed and had wonderful opportunities like this one. Thank you. I would like to introduce the next speaker, Heather, a caregiver. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today and speak alongside my fellow heart failure champions. As Donna mentioned, my name is Heather and I was a caregiver for my husband, Jamie, who was diagnosed with heart failure at the age of 34. Like many of my colleagues have spoke about, Jamie too displayed the classic heart failure symptoms long before diagnosis. Shortness of breath, palpitations, unable to walk long distances, unable to climb stairs or lie flat. But while my colleagues took you through the heart failure journey from a patient's perspective, I'm going to take you through a little bit of a different journey, and that's the caregiver perspective. So as several others alluded, Jamie's heart failure symptoms began long before he was ever diagnosed. And looking back, that is kind of when I became a caregiver. But again, like diagnosis, it wasn't that my role was fully understood or even really thought about at that moment in time. I remember watching Jamie give up things he loved, playing in his band, going to work as a teacher, hanging out with friends. And while it was all very worrisome to watch Jamie's health deteriorate, I was frustrated by what was happening. I was in my late 20s at the time. We just bought our first home. Our careers were taking off and life was heading in the right direction. Jamie's illness put a break on life. It made me constantly feel like I was on call. We were unable to make plans because a trip to the ER could be at any moment in time. And the carefree lifestyle I once enjoyed was slowly being taken away. With the diagnosis, much like Cynthia said, came shock, heart failure. My 29 year old brain could not process what this meant. For what I knew, heart failure was something that happened to people who were old and Jamie really wasn't old. Diagnosis came two weeks before we were set to get married. And I remember standing in the ICU hearing these news all while wearing my wedding shoes, which I was very desperate to break in for the big day. What complicated matters was that we were living in Newfoundland and the care that Jamie needed to treat his heart failure was not available locally. So minutes after hearing heart failure, I then heard, there is nothing we can do. You must go to Toronto. I raced to the airport to get a flight. There wasn't room on the medevac for me, all while hoping that Jamie would still be alive by the time I got to Toronto. Luckily he was and we spent two weeks in Toronto stabilizing Jamie and receiving a crash course in how to live with heart failure. Things like measuring sodium, fluid, inputs, outputs, new medications, taking blood pressure, giving heparin shots, and so on. So overnight, I went from Jamie's fiance to his caregiver with a newfound skill set and appreciation for the medical profession. While adjusting to this new life with heart failure was challenging, once we got the hang of things, living with heart failure was manageable. Yes, things weren't perfect. We had to be careful when eating out. We carried Jamie's medical file with us whenever we traveled or were far away from the home. But we were able to live life and do all the things that a normal newly married couple would be able to do. By 2014, Jamie's condition deteriorated and doctors felt that it was time to relocate to Toronto to discuss heart transplant. Moving to Toronto was difficult. We felt as if we had been plucked from our home and dropped into a strange place, not by choice, but by necessity. 
Relocation turned our lives upside down. We left our house, family, community, and jobs, and tried to set up a temporary home, all while dealing with a very serious illness. It was during this time that my caregiver role really started to take shape, as Jamie got sicker and there was nobody else around to care for him other than myself. The stress I was under was profound. The treatments were not working, and after spending hours each and every day at the hospital with Jamie, I would then return to my hotel room alone. The fear of the unknown was enormous. I didn't know how long we'd be in Toronto. I didn't know when or if Jamie would get on the transplant list. And I had no idea what to do about accommodations in Toronto, our home in Newfoundland, and how we would support ourselves. In addition to this stress, I was mad. Much of my anger was directed towards Jamie. He was the reason we were in Toronto. He was the reason my life was on hold. These were thoughts I could never say out loud. What kind of person would I be if I was angry that my life was on hold while Jamie was fighting for his life? These thoughts circled in my head, fear, worry, stress, anger, and guilt for thinking about my needs instead of Jamie's. Jamie's medical conditions, can, medical challenges continued with a code blue distress call, a thyroidectomy, a pacemaker, a defibrillator, and finally a VAD. Each, pr each procedure came with a new set of challenges and a new set of learning. The VAD required the most learning and in order for Jamie to be discharged, I had to pass VAD training. Being an A student my entire life, I was ready. I was going to pass this exam. I explained the parts of the VAD and regurgitated the manual word for word. Next was a sterile dressing change. I failed. I inadvertently touched my glove off my shirt contaminating it. As a result, Jamie was not able to be discharged. Jamie blew up at me. He had been in hospital for six weeks and was desperate to get out. I failed him. He had to stay another night there because of me. I failed myself. I left the hospital in tears. I tell you the story so you can see the pressure placed on caregivers. While a sterile dressing change must be completed perfectly, I'm confident the medical team had no idea of the pressure and stress this caused. And for the record, I did take the test the next day and aced it. Much like adjusting to life with heart failure, life with a VAD was a similar experience. Jamie's fluid and sodium restrictions continued. He had new medications, and we also had to get used to all the equipment that came with the VAD. Batteries, controllers, wall plugs, while it was strange to listen to Jamie Whirl, and it was odd to plug him in at night, we survived. And I owe a whole lot of this to Jamie. While I was always the type A, stressed, worried one, and still am, Jamie was a laid back, type B, go with the flow, goofy kind of guy. It was these humor, jokes, and making fun of himself that got us through the tough times. Uh, can we put up the next picture, uh, Catherine? So finally, after 947 days in Toronto, we received the call we had been waiting for. A new heart had been found. I remember hearing this news. A cold shiver went down my body. My face was flushed. My mouth went dry. I was in shock. I could not believe this was finally happening. And the, the photo I've chosen to show here on the screen is just moments after that, that, uh, that phone call. And as you can tell, we were all smiles because Jamie was about to get his new heart. So sadly, the transplant was not a success. And on May 23rd, 2017, Jamie passed away. He was 39. So as you can see, there were many times when caregiving was hard. I often felt scared, stressed, overwhelmed, and alone. There were times I felt invisible and that my whole purpose in life revolved around Jamie. I went from being Jamie's wife to being his doctor, nurse, pharmacist, dietitian, coach, therapist, and so on. And luckily for Jamie, my social work background actually gave me some training in at least one of these areas. While there were challenges, I learned a lot about myself and felt that caring for Jamie made our relationship stronger. We learned that we had to work as a team. While we were both stressed, scared, and overwhelmed, there was no point in taking it out on each other. When things got really hard, Jamie would remind me that it's just you and me against the world and that we had no choice but to work together. 
As for myself, I learned I am way stronger than I ever thought. Before meeting Jamie, I would faint at the sight of blood. But after caring for Jamie, I can now measure pee, clean a driveline, collect a stool sample, and even hold a beating heart. And not to worry, it wasn't Jamie's beating heart. It was a medical demonstration that I was participating in. I've become more compassionate and empathetic, and I'm grateful to work with other patients and caregivers and share my story with others in the hopes of helping someone who may also be on their heart failure journey. So thank you everybody for listening. I'll now turn it back to Mark, who's going to uh, wrap things up for the session. Wow, uh, that was uh, amazing. Thank you to our panel of speakers, Cynthia, Tracy, Wayne, Donna, Heather. Your stories uh, are amazing. Uh, you know, I have to take a few minutes to reflect after this session about what we heard here. Happy to hear that they'll all be available on recording after. I mean, it just shows the unique experience of heart failure, both through the patient and caregiver lens. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to share this with us. This session ran right to the end. So unfortunately we don't have time for questions but we will share them with the participants, any that you've sent in advance. And I'll lead you into the break. After the break, we have two more sessions, one on support and mental health, stronger in heart failure, and live now and plan for the future, talking about advanced care planning. So please take a short break and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much, everyone.